Good evening and welcome to our Wednesday evening prayer uh, for Ordinary Time, week three in the Liturgy of the Hours. For those who maybe are not familiar with our schedule, if you look on the front of your worship aid, at the very bottom, there's a key down there. And the bold italic uh, will be the leader. The plain bold will be all the congregation. Uh, the plain type side one will be over here. This will be side one. And over here is side two. And when you see the symbol of the cross, you make the sign of the cross. Oh God, come to my assistance. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. seated. Those who sow in tears will reap in joy. When the Lord delivered Zion from bondage, it seemed like a dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter, and on our lips there were songs. The heathens themselves said, what marvels the Lord work for them. What marvels the Lord work for us. Indeed, we were glad. Deliver us, O Lord, from our bondage as streams in dry land. Those who are sowing in tears will sing when they reap. They go out, they go out full of tears, carrying seed for the sowing. They come back, they come back full of song, carrying their sheaves. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Those who, who sow in tears will reap, reap in joy. joy. May the Lord build our house and guard our city. If the Lord does not build the house, in vain do its builders labor. If the Lord does not watch over the city, in vain does the watchman keep vigil. In vain is your earlier rising, your going later to rest. You who toil for the bread you eat, when he pours gifts on his beloved while they slumber. Truly, sons are a gift from the Lord, a blessing, the fruit of the womb. Indeed, the sons of youth are like arrows in the hands of a warrior. Oh, the happiness of the man who has filled his quiver with these arrows. He will have no cause for shame when he disputes with his foes in the gateways. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. May the Lord, Lord build, build our, our house, house and guard, guard our, our city. city. He is the firstborn of all creation. In every way, the primacy is his. Let us give thanks to the Father for having made you worthy to share the lot of the saints in life. 
He rescued us from the power of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of his beloved Son. Through him we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creatures. In him, everything in heaven and on earth was created, things visible and invisible. All were created through him, all were created for him. He is before all else that is. In him, everything continues in being. It is he who is head of the body, the church, for he is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, so that primacy may be his in everything. It pleased God to make absolute fullness reside in him, and by means of him to reconcile everything in his person, both on earth and in the heavens, making peace through the blood of his cross. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. He is the firstborn of all creation. In every way, the primacy is his. To God, whose power now at work in us can do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, world without end. Amen. Claim me once more as your own, Lord, and have mercy on me. Claim me once more as your own, Lord, and have mercy on me. Do not abandon me with the wicked. Have mercy on me. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Claim me once more as your own, Lord, and have mercy on me. Please stand for our gospel canticle. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has looked with favor on his lowly servant. From this day, all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. He has mercy on those who fear him in every generation. He has shown the strength of his arm. He has scattered the proud in their conceit. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones and has lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has come to the help of his servant Israel for he has remembered his promise of mercy, the promise he made to our fathers, to Abraham and his children, forever. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Let us humbly pray to God, who sent his Son as the Savior and exemplar of his people. May your people praise thee, Lord. Let us give thanks to God who chose us as the first fruits of salvation. And who called us to share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. May those who confess your holy name be united in your truth. And fervent in your love. Creator of all things, your son desired to work among men with his own hands. Be mindful of all who earn their living by the sweat of your brow. Be mindful of those who devote themselves to the service of their brothers. Do not let them be deterred from their goals by discouraging results or lack of support. Be merciful to the faithful departed. Keep them from the power of the evil one. Together we say the prayer that Jesus himself has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. And let us pray. 
Merciful Lord, let the evening prayer of your church come before you. May we do your work faithfully, free us from sin, and make us secure in your love. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. And the Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless us. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks be to God. Welcome everyone to tonight's Vespers. We're lucky in, uh, to have Father Michael Renier, as, who's a pastor of Epiphany of Our Lord Parish in St. Louis near Francis Park. He is a former Anglican priest and he was ordained in 2016 under a pastoral provision for the reception of Anglicans and Episcopalians into full communion with the Catholic Church. He and his wife Amber have six children. I just can't imagine what his schedule must look like during soccer season. <laughs> Please welcome Father Renier. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm Father Michael. Um, now, Francis Park, I, I have to tell you, so South City, it's, it's very touchy in South City. Francis Park, that's St. Gabriel, who are, that's our avowed enemies, but uh, yeah, yeah, I'll let you slide on that one. Uh, yeah, Epiphany's Lindenwood Park, and never the two shall meet, right? Uh, so we do not cross parish boundaries in South City. Um, um, so my, my topic this evening is C.S. Lewis uh, and his conversion story. Uh, C.S. Lewis converted to the Church of England, which is also known as the Anglican Church, or in the United States as the Episcopal Church. Uh, and perhaps, and it sounds like you invited me knowing a little bit of my own background. I don't know if you chose the C.S. Lewis topic knowing that I had that Anglican background or not, but um, from 2003 through 2006, I attended the Episcopalian uh, Seminary at Yale Divinity School, and then from 06 to 2010, I served as an Anglican pastor. Uh, I had two small churches, one in the town of Sandwich and then one in Brewster uh, in Cape Cod, uh, Massachusetts. So I suffered for our Lord there about two miles from the beach. Uh, it was <laughs> unbelievable, right, as a first assignment. They said, oh, you're just gonna go live at the beach and you know, a bunch of tourists will come and you'll, you'll go out to the beach in the morning on Sunday and, and, and have, you know, have your services there. Uh, I, I enjoyed every second of it, and I always make clear to people, I did not become Catholic because I was unhappy with my life. Uh, the Catholic Church exerts a, a very positive, uh, magnetic pull on those. She gets her, her mitts into. Uh, so I was received, along with Amber, my wife, and at that time our three children, uh, into full communion with the church in 2011 here in St. Louis. So I was born in St. Charles, Grew up here, uh, left when I was 18, and then as we were coming back into the church and making a bunch of big life choices, decided to come back to St. Louis. Uh, so after my reception into the church, uh, I was allowed to prepare for ordination to the priesthood under the guidelines that were laid out first by uh, Pope St. John Paul II around the year 1981. Uh, which makes possible the ordination of former Anglican or Episcopal clergy, uh, even if we're already married. Uh, some of you uh, may be interested to know that in the Eastern Catholic churches, married men have always been allowed to seek ordination to the priesthood. Uh, in the West, uh, the Roman Rite, which is vastly what we're all familiar with, the discipline 
uh, for oh, probably over a thousand years or so has been priestly celibacy. Uh, my, uh, my intuition is that that discipline will continue of priestly celibacy, and uh, I support it continuing. Sometimes people hear I'm a married priest, and they say, oh, Father, we think all priests should be married too, and it's great. And I say, well, you, you know, you fight for your opinion and contend for it, but that's not really why I'm, I'm here. I'm just happy the exception was made for, for me. I'm glad to be that exception. Uh, and it's interesting to note, though, that in the church east or west, no man who has already received holy orders has ever been allowed to marry. But I'm not necessarily here to talk through all my ordination, but rather conversion. Uh, what causes a person to, uh, I think, in the first place, become a committed Christian? And in particular, what causes a person to convert into a more ritualistic form of worship, such as the Mass? Uh, C.S. Lewis converted uh, from atheism directly to uh, Anglicanism, and then he lived the rest of his life in the Church of England. He never became Catholic, uh, although much of what he says and teaches, I think, uh, finds a lot of resonance in the Catholic Church. So as a Catholic, you can read him, I think, fairly fruitfully. Uh, I personally went from Pentecostal, so I grew up in St. Charles, going to St. Louis Family Church in Chester City. Chesterfield Valley. I don't know if anyone's familiar with them. They were running those commercials for years and years and years, and the pastor was Pastor Jeff, and he'd get on and he'd say, Jesus loves you on the, on the TV, and then he'd smile and like, I, I promise you, like, a light like glinted off his tooth, because it's like a toothpaste commercial. Uh, and so I, I grew up there uh, as a Pentecostal, or they might call themselves Charismatics. I uh, went to Oral Roberts University, which is a big Pentecostal University in Tulsa, founded by Oral Roberts, who was a, a, an old uh, tent revival preacher, basically. While I was there, became Anglican, and then on into the, the Catholic faith. So slightly different stories with me and C.S. Lewis there, but I think some, some interesting overlaps, and he was certainly influential uh, in my life. Uh, he writes uh, in his autobiography, you must picture me alone in that room at Magdalene, Magdalene's one of the colleges at Oxford. Night after night, feeling whenever my mind lifted even for a second from my work, the steady, unrelenting approach of him, God, whom I so earnestly desired not to meet. That which I greatly feared had at last come upon me. In Trinity term of 1929, I gave in and admitted that God was God, and I knelt and prayed that night, the most dejected, reluctant convert in all England. And that's a somewhat I think, famous quote from uh, the book Surprised by Joy, in which he recounts how he became a Christian that night in his apartment at Oxford against his own desires. He did not want to be a Christian, uh, but against that desire to continue being atheist in spite of himself he believed and he became convinced that God is real and so his conversion was more of a surrender as if there was an overpowering army that conquered him it's not something he sought out at the time he was the professor of English literature at Oxford and he stayed in that position until 1954 but it was not until around 1941 uh, that he began to read uh, the Screwtape Letters, if you're familiar with that book, on the radio. And that's when he became famous as a, as a Christian writer, 1941. But until then, his reputation uh, was, was not built on his Christian um, nonfiction books or the Narnia books, but his reputation was that he was a very serious, well-respected academic scholar of medieval Anglo-Saxon literature. He loved mythology. Uh, Lewis was born in 1898 into an Anglo-Irish family in Belfast. And after what he calls a, a somewhat blandly Christian childhood, he threw himself into atheism 
In the middle of his autobiography, he says, amiable agnostics talk cheerfully about man's search for God, but he comes to believe that we describe that search backwards. The story of conversion, really anyone's conversion or reversion, or for you, maybe that time in your adulthood when you decided, I am going to take my faith seriously, it's very rarely that we have searched out God. We have discovered something that the people around us in our neighborhoods who are not religious just weren't smart or clever enough to discover, but we did. But the story of conversion is God's search for man. And he seeks us out with a compelling embrace. And this is one of the points that Lewis makes over and over again. And he talks about how awe-inspiring natural beauty, uh, the beauty of the arts, poetry, mythology, natural joy, how compelling these things are for someone who does not yet believe in God. And beauty and joy really were kind of like the two uh, poles on which Lewis staked his entire uh, life. Uh, beauty and its fruit, which is joy. So he, he believed that, well, if you, if you recognize beauty, then you will take joy in it, and that will affect your entire life. And he says joy is an unsatisfied desire which is itself more desirable than any other satisfaction. And he says, I, I'm going to define it as a technical term. It must be distinguished from happiness and from pleasure. So he's saying joy is not the same as those two things, but it has one defining characteristic, he says, uh, in common with them, which is the fact that anyone who has experienced joy will want to experience it again. Or you'll want that that feeling or that sense of, of peaceful happiness to return. And I think that when we discuss conversion narratives, we tend to focus on how people uncover the truth of the faith. Uh, but in my experience, that is rarely the way that it works. Uh, so for instance, I became Catholic uh, purely because of beauty. I encountered very beautiful, reverent masses, uh, knew nothing about what was going on, slightly off-put by some of the pieces of those masses, but overwhelmed in other ways by the challenge of, of the beauty that I encountered there. It was something I had never seen. I had never uh, encountered something so authentic and mysterious. Uh, taking the lesson from Lewis here, it's clear that if we desire converts, uh, we will not water down the mass. And we will not obsess over these questions of relevance or trying to make every single piece of it understandable, uh, particularly at the expense of beauty. Uh, beauty, like God, can be incomprehensible. It can be difficult. It can be challenging. But once we catch it, once we experience it, we want to experience it again. And this is why people come back to the Catholic Church. Coming to the faith is not a prize that's earned by those who have the intellect uh, to uncover uh, the truth more efficiently than other people. But the faith is a gift. Lewis talks about the strange notion that God calls us into the church even though we are reluctant and even though we are very much imperfect. I did not then see what is now the most shining and obvious thing, he says, the divine humility which will accept a convert even on such terms. The prodigal son at least walked home on his own feet. But who can duly adore that love which will open the high gates to a prodigal who is brought in kicking, struggling, resentful, and darting his eyes in every di direction for a chance of escape. The hardness of God is kinder than the softness of men, and his compulsion is our liberation. And then he goes on and he actually lists some of what he calls the perils or the dangers that over time attacked and then undermined his atheism. Beauty, the gift of joy, the wonder of everyday life, real people who extended real friendship to him, uh, 
not in order to convert him, but simply out of that, that, uh, that love of friendship, no strings attached. He mentions a number of dangerous encounters, quote unquote dangerous, among uh, his friends who influenced him. So he lists um, the writer Owen Barfield, who's a very famous uh, poet, um, G.K. Chesterton, who's a little older, uh, and he was already a very popular writer at the time, and Chesterton himself had converted to Catholicism in 1922, so about seven years before Lewis. But he was very influential. Um, there was a fairy tale author, a man named George MacDonald. Lewis loved his fairy tales. And of course, J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, who he met at Oxford. And Tolkien hadn't yet become famous for The Lord of the Rings, um, but he was very much a kindred spirit, and the two of them would talk about mythology for hours and hours. And Lewis says that MacDonald and Chesterton laid a trap for with the elegance of their writing. And then he says it was Tolkien who sprung the trap. So those two, particularly Lewis and, and Tolkien, became great friends. They met at Oxford in the 1920s. Uh, they talked about mythology, and it was maybe a few years after uh, that incident in 1929, where Lewis says he reluctantly gave in. And uh, so it was a few years after that that he formalized his faith, and then he was finally able to openly admit uh, he wrote a letter to a friend, and he says, I just passed on from believing in God to definitely believing in, in Christ, in Christianity. My long talk with Tolkien had a great deal to do with it. Uh, Owen Barfield probably also had a lot to do with helping Lewis move from uh, a theoretical interest. So Lewis, at first, the reason he's so reluctant is he, he intellectually believes in God, and he's convinced of his realness, but he doesn't want to live a Christian life. And so he keeps putting it off and putting it off because it's very theoretical to him. And he says Barfield said something that really moved him finally into the full practice of the faith. Uh, they were talking one day about philosophy, and, and Lewis was saying, well, philosophy is a very interesting subject. And Barfield retorted that to Plato, philosophy was not a subject, it was a life. And that's Christianity, yeah? not an idea so much as it is a relationship with a living person, Jesus Christ. It is a real living faith that pl places demands upon us, that transforms us, that converts us. And this is why this faith that is so living and active appeals far more to our sense of beauty and goodness. Why the faith is founded upon the virtues, these actions, faith, hope, love. Uh, the intellect is, of course, vital to helping us know the God that we desire to love. But every virtue must be united with love. It must be active. Faith cannot remain a mere belief. The faith is a life to be lived. It is a God to be loved. And there's a few aspects in that, I think, of, of a life, particularly changes that I noticed in myself, uh, in my own conversion through Anglicanism and towards Catholicism, that it seems, if, if you read Lewis, that he shares some of those particular uh, changes in his own life. So I don't know if you're familiar with the, the Pentecostal church, um, but I was Pentecostal until I was about 19, 20 years old. And if you go into a Pentecostal worship service, uh, it looks nothing like a mass. You go in, there's a kind of a rock band set up, super professional, super talented. They'll play about a 30 to 40 minute uh, praise and worship set. Everyone gets really worked up, really emotional. And I don't mean to make fun of them or belittle them. There's, I think there's, there's some value to this. Um, and then there will be probably about a 45 minute sermon. And then that's kind of, that's it, right? So there's no, there's no such thing as, you know, the, the, the Eucharist. That's not something that they believe in. Um, so for me, as a very introverted, very self-conscious young teenager, it drove me crazy. <laughs> um, because I would come in and I'd look around, right, and I would see um, 
okay, well, we're, we're, because they wouldn't tell you what to do, right? Because <laughs> right? only Catholics tell you what to do. Um, so you'd come in and, and, and the spirit has to, to flow and it has to be spontaneous. So they'd start playing music and maybe the person next to you would stand up. And then you look a, a, few, a few rows ahead, someone would, would kneel. Someone would put their hands up and close their eyes and start you know, singing that way. And I kind of knew what was happening. Once that first person stands up, we're eventually all going to be standing, right? <laughs> but it's just a, just a question of when. So as this very self-conscious person, I'm thinking, okay, I'm not going to be first. Never going to happen, right? I'm also, I can't be last because <laughs> that'll look, because I'm, I'm overanalyzing everything, right? I don't want to look too pious or holier than thou, so I'm not first. I can't be last because I don't want to seem hesitant or I'm just going along with it reluctantly. So I've got to find the sweet spot right in the middle, right? And I'm going to stand, but the whole thing goes like this, right? For someone with my sort of mental outlook, which I would say is probably about half of us, right? Introverts and people who are kind of self-conscious and very, we have to process things for quite a while. Uh, before we understand what's going on. Um, when I took my uh, psychological exams to get into to Kenrick here, because I audited some classes for Kenrick, the psychologist said, well, it's a, it all looks good, but you don't seem to understand your emotions at all, like at any given moment. <laughs> and I was like, that's, that's pretty accurate. Like, I don't know how I'm feeling. And I always have to go back a week later and think, oh, I was, I was rude. You know, to my wife, and I need to apologize to her. And the reason why is because I was stressed out and I didn't know it because this was going on. So it can be a strength because I just do what needs to be done, but it's also very much a weakness at times because I have no clue what I'm experiencing inwardly. So I have to be really, uh, I, I need time to really process what's going on. Uh, so when I found the Anglican Church, and the Anglican Church, uh, their worship looks very much like a mass. Uh, very formal. So when the, when the Anglican Church split from the Roman Catholic Church in 1549-ish, uh, uh, they didn't really want to change anything. King Henry VIII just wanted to, to marry more women. <laughs> that was really the whole thing. But he didn't want to change the worship. So, so Anglican worship is, is very structured. It's very formal. And when I went in for the first time, and I had never seen this in my life, and you all probably take it for granted, and I probably do at this point now that I've been Catholic for long enough, and I came in and, and bell rang. I don't know if you guys have a bell, but there's some places they ring a bell to start the procession. And the bell rang, and everyone stood. And then the priest got to the front, and you know, the father, the son, and everyone did this, right? And I'm, I'm thinking, this is amazing. This is, this is the best. Like, we all just do it together. I don't have to think about what I'm doing. There's a, there's a, a set expectation that once I figure it out, right? So sometimes people will belittle that. They'll say, well, it's rote, and you're not thinking about it. It's, it's the opposite. I, I promise you it's the opposite if you approach it with the right attitude because it sets you free to pray. Uh, you don't have to think about what's going on. And you are praying not individually, surrounded by other people, but you are praying corporately with your brothers and sisters in Christ. And that is a beautiful thing. Uh, C.S. Lewis uh, struggled with self-consciousness. And once he explained that this experience, he was trying to pray. He was just by himself, but he was trying to pray spontaneously. So that's how I was taught to pray, too. You just say the words. It's a conversation, and don't repeat the Lord's Prayer. That's something Catholics do. It's boring, right? Uh, you need to make up your own conversation every single time. And, of course, there is an appropriate time for that, and some people love to pray that way. I just think about what I want to say next. Uh, I think about, was well, God listening to me? Did I phrase it the right way? Was that awkward? Uh, so, and and C.S. Lewis explains it the same way. He said it felt like he was outside of himself watching. And then he goes on to explain, we can't examine our experiences as we're having them, because if we stop to examine them, then we stop having the experience. We're always thinking about what we want to say next or what we want to do next. And because of that, we can't relax and pray. So the experience needs to be given to us as a ritual action, as a formal action by the church, as a corporate action, and then we are set free to pray as individuals. Um, human beings are not, uh, we're, we're hybrids, we're sort of hybrids in terms of what we are, uh, what screw tape would call uh, amphibians, half spirit, half animal. So in other words, we are composite beings, we have body and soul. Uh, I think Aristotle would say our bodies are soul-shaped. 
So a human being is not just a soul that's trapped inside of a physical body. So when you go to heaven, you go to heaven with your resurrected body after the final judgment, because that's part of who you are. To be human is to be physical. Uh, the soul is uh, the principle by which the body develops. And it's, I think it's easy for us as Christians to forget that sometimes. Uh, and we end up adopting uh, a couple of different maybe attitudes that I think are more common among Pagans, and sometimes you hear it described as, well, I'm spiritual but not religious, right? That's a way of saying, well, I kind of do whatever I want in my mind, right? But I don't actually make any effort in my actions or, or to actually physically go to a church and pray. Um, so there's this one extreme of, of hating the body and exalting uh, just the spirit because that's all that's important. We're trying to escape everything uh, in this world that physical things are bad. That's one extreme. The other is body worshiping uh, indulgence. So just thinking everything's physical. That's all that matters. There's no spiritual realm. And of course, Christianity rejects both of these extremes. And in contrast to those who hate the physical world and consider that religion is a, a process of the spirit escaping, C.S. Lewis insists God never meant man to be a purely spiritual creature. He likes matter. He invented it. And then he goes on to express the dignity of the body when he writes, for our body, but for our body, one whole realm of God's glory, all that we receive through the senses, right? So what we see, taste, touch, hear, smell, would be upraised. For the beasts cannot appreciate it. And the angels, I suppose, are pure intelligences. They understand colors and tastes. Uh, but do they have a palate? Do they see through a retina? I fancy the beauties of nature are a secret that God has shared with us alone. And by that, I mean he means mankind. That may be one of the reasons, he says, why we were made and why the resurrection of the body is such an important doctrine. And so he's suggesting here that because of our physical bodies, human beings know something about God that even the angels don't know. All of our knowledge comes through our senses. That's why the, the, the mass is so tactile. You taste the bread on your tongue. You smell the incense. You feel uh, your knees aching on the kneeler. There are particular aspects of God's love that can only be communicated through the senses. Uh, something of God which the seraphim Caravan can never quite understand flows into us from something like how the sky is blue, the taste of honey, hugging your child. Lewis says the body ought to pray as well as the soul. Body and soul are better for it. Practically speaking, this means that the mass, the more it appeals to our senses, the more smells and bells, so to speak, the more that we are set free from over-intellectualizing it or over-emotionalizing it. And so the, the mass, as it's been handed down to us by the church, perfectly fits our human nature, and it allows us to leave self-consciousness behind and rest in God's presence. And this uh, is how the mass improves our attentiveness to these things that are so important, the higher things, and allows us and enables us to experience God more fully. And so I'll say this at, at Epiphany of Our Lord, where I'm the pastor, um, once we added back, because uh, I'm an unrepentant esthete, <laughs> uh, once we added back the ringing of the bells, we did a lot of work there. We, we added back incense regularly for one of the Sunday masses. We added back chant. Uh, I wear really, really nice vestments. Uh, the masses, once we did that, the masses started to overflow with children. And people don't expect that because um, it doesn't seem like that's what would happen. That these young families, that these children would really, really love this uh, very uh, imaginative form of worship. But if you think about it, it's exactly what you would expect to happen because children learn, the catechism calls it mystagogy, um, th 
through the action of prayer and through that appeal to their imagination through the senses. All right, so that's a kid-friendly mass. The way I grew up, actually, in the Pentecostal church, that's, that's uh, adult only, really. They would take the kids out uh, because it was so intellectual, right? A kid can't sit there and listen to a, a priest talk for 45 minutes. I couldn't even hear myself talk for 45 minutes during a homily. I just got a, a permanent deacon, and it's wonderful. And I told the parishioners, the best thing about this is I can just not hear myself talk for a mass because he, he'll preach, and because I get so tired of it. But we are all, children and, and alike, drawn into the mass more easily, drawn out of ourselves, drawn out of our self-consciousness by that imaginative corporate worship of the church. And that's something that C.S. Lewis greatly valued. And so that's, that's that sort of second aspect of conversion, which is the conversion of the, the imagination and being drawn into an imaginative uh, understanding of the world. And that's very natural to someone like C.S. Lewis who already understands the value of mythology, for instance. So a friend of his uh, named Ruth Pitter once said, uh, his whole life was oriented and motivated by an almost uniquely persisting child's sense of glory and of nightmare. The adult events were received into a medium still as pliable as wax. Wide open to the glory, equally vulnerable, with a man's strength to feel it all, and a great scholar and writer's skills to express and interpret. So Lewis, she's saying there, he had a childlike wonder. He looked around at life, this life that we are blessed to live, and he was amazed wonder is vital as socrates says it is the beginning of wisdom to simply look up and wonder why is this so amazing uh, in a homily called the weight of glory lewis explains how the beautiful things of this world as we stand in wonder of them lead us on to the source of all beauty these things he says are only the scent of a flower we have not yet found the echo of the tune we have not heard, news from a country we have never yet visited. So he's saying these things lead us to contemplation of heaven. And all of these things are somehow mysteriously connected to heaven. Elsewhere he says, an unattainable ecstasy has hovered just beyond the grasp of my consciousness. And the sweetest thing of all my life has been the longing to find the place where all that beauty came from. And that desire of his to know that origin, all of the, the joy and the wonder of the created world, of poetry and literature and mythology, it fired his imagination to then seek out the God from whom all of that flowed. And all of that beauty, all of that joy, he quickly understood it was pointing to heaven. Or as he says, a pointer to something other and out of. So why did C.S. Lewis become a Christian? Uh, because of the beauty, joy, and wonder of the faith as he experienced it that set him free from self-consciousness and allowed him to experience a real life. It revealed and helped him to understand the importance of the things that he already loved, the poetic imagination. So why does anyone convert? Uh, the exact same reason. I'm not convinced that it happens because uh, we have some secret method of evangelization or uh, some technique or program. Um, I'm, I'm far more confident saying that people convert to the faith because they encounter sacramental beauty, incarnate beauty, a mysterious, incomprehensible, yet life-changing realization that God offers us a life to be lived a joyful, happy, and beautiful life. Okay, thank you. So I have to answer. I have to answer questions now. <laughs> Act like I know what I was. Okay. Uh, it, just raise hands and go for it. Okay. Okay, and, and then you just, just call time when we're exhausted. Okay. Otherwise, I'll just keep. Okay. What's your favorite Lewis book? My favorite Lewis book? Um, it's probably the fictional book. There's a book called Till We Have Faces. 
that's very hard to describe, but I remember, and, and I, it's been a long time since I've read C.S. Lewis. I read, I think I read everything he wrote in college. So I was probably 20, 21 years old. And I read all of it start to finish. I liked that one quite a bit. And I remember The Great Divorce was really uh, thought provoking for me. That's one where he kind of talks about, well, he, he kind of imagines what hell might be like in reality and what puts us there. Uh, and I thought that one was really, uh, really interesting. Uh, yeah, I like, I like uh, Till We Have Faces. The Narnia books, are, uh, Tolkien always said they're not good. <laughs> I'll let you judge that. Where do you begin? Um, so it, it kind of depends what you're interested in. So, cause he has a pretty wide range of stuff. So um, probably, um, what was the one I, I wanna make sure I get the title exactly right, Surprised by Joy. That's the one where he, that's his autobiography where he kind of talks about um, his own life and what brought him into the faith. I think that's a good spot to start. Surprised by Joy, yeah. And then of course the Narnia books are fun if you haven't read those. Uh, if you're looking for fiction. Um, he's got some that are really hard if you want to challenge. So like the problem of pain is super hard to understand. Uh, good luck with that one. But, you know, it's, it's, it's got good stuff in it. Right, so there's, the, so there's Episcopal churches all around, and it's complicated, and I kind of use Anglican and, and Episcopalian uh, overlapping, but they're not quite that. Um, so when I was in, in Tulsa, I became Episcopalian. Um, and there's not a, a whole lot of Episcopalians in St. Louis, but they're definitely around. There's Episcopal churches. Um, so this is in Tulsa, Oklahoma, sort of the, the rhinestone studded, you know, belt buckle of the Bible belt. And so even Episcopalians down there have a certain vibe, right? <laughs> um, uh, and so I was Episcopalian for a couple of years and then went to Connecticut to, to Yale and everyone was different. And I thought, well, God, it tricked me. And this is a, a nasty trick because this, these people are crazy, right? Um, just a very different culture. The Episcopal Church, this is in 2003, had been in decline for a while before that. But in 2000, I'm going to say it was 2003 or four, not long after I had started school with the intention of becoming an Episcopal pastor, the Episcopal Church lost its mind entirely. So they started um, blessing same-sex marriages and, um, and, and that sort of thing. And the church kind of schismed into two pieces and so now you have the Episcopal Church, and they're the ones who really anything goes. And then you have um, the Anglican Church that tends to be a lot more socially conservative, for lack of a better way of describing it. And those are very rare. I think there's one um, in St. Louis somewhere. Um, so I went into Yale Divinity as an Episcopal and left as an Anglican. Um, but Episcopal churches are, are all over the place, so they weren't too hard to to connect with, yeah. And the reason I went there, I, I went to a Catholic church, I believe it's called Holy Family Cathedral in Tulsa. I went to mass there a couple times and I remember being kind of stunned by it uh, and being very attracted to it. But I had been raised my whole life to think that you all were just pagan heathens who worship you know, statues and you know, whatever your worst misconceptions are about Catholicism, I believed. So I really wasn't ready uh, emotionally to become Catholic even though I think I kind of saw something there in the church even back then. Yeah. I think you're right. So George MacDonald, I believe, lived and died as, as an Anglican. They're super interesting. Yeah, so if anyone has kids or grandkids, they're, they're fun to read those books to them. Yeah, did you, have, you, have you thought through your question at length? Because I would never ask a question out loud before having really thought about how I want to say it.
Right, so, so C.S. Lewis and Tolkien both, they, they, they felt mythology and Christianity were connected. So he, he, they didn't find it a, a challenge, right, or say, well, that's mythology and that's, that's pagan and bad and, and we're over here being you know, pure and good and holy. Um, I'm trying to think which one of them it was that said it. It was probably Tolkien who said, yeah, Christianity is a fairy tale. It's a true fairy tale. It really happened. Um, and every other fairy tale like all these mythologies, Greek myth and the Near Eastern myths and all these things, he said, well, they're kind of like pieces, like little shards of the truth that are kind of out there and they're floating around. It's kind of like, you know, like there's, there's a lot of goodness out there. There's a, there's a lot of beauty out there. Um, natural virtue certainly exists, which is why you can look at a complete atheist and say, well, that atheist has a lot of good qualities their good qualities just without God's grace aren't enough to achieve heaven. That's the, that's the problem. But it's not that they're completely bad and have to be rejected. So same with mythology. So they kind of looked at it as like a foreshadowing, right? So even in the Old Testament, you see, you know, how um, the manna that the Israelites ate in the desert is a foreshadowing of the Eucharist and going through the Red Sea is a foreshadowing of baptism and so on. And, uh, Lewis kind of looked at mythology as that. So he, he's not going to say, well, just accept that all is truth and it's all good. But with some discernment, you can look at it and see how the world is kind of intuitively grasping for this idea that we need a savior, we need heroes, we need virtues. We're on a heroic journey, right? So you read the Iliad and the Odyssey and you're seeing a story of a man who's trying to find home who's on a heroic journey and it requires a certain sense of reverence and faithfulness and virtue in order to get home. Uh, and all of these things are kind of building up to the fullness of the revelation that is Christianity. So is, is that clear? That's kind of a, a subtle combo. So I don't want anyone to go away saying, oh, Father Rainier says uh, Christianity is a fairy tale. You know? <laughs> so. <laughs> It's real. Jesus really lived and died. Okay. <laughs> yes, right there. Are you familiar with the Catholic Church and Eucharist? A little bit, but to be really honest, I have a lot of PTSD around some of that stuff. So, so it's 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 not for me. Yeah, if that makes sense. And I'm not saying it's it, it shouldn't exist, but yeah. The time. I'll do one more. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, well, I'm writing a book on this for Sophia Press, so, <laughs> so it's something I've thought about a little bit. So the wonder of childhood, right? Uh, and the, uh, so Chesterton would say, well, that's, that's something we lose, and we shouldn't lose it. And he talks about his own dad in his autobiography. He says, look, my dad, to, to outside appearances, he seemed like just a kind of a businessman. He said, but my dad would come home and go in the garage and he'd build toys for us. And, you know, and, and, and he had this whole secret hidden life that was very childlike. Um, but it affected Chesterton so much because he says his dad, it was like he took a key and he opened a door, right? Uh, and he stepped through that door. So the mass is a door. The mass is the gate to heaven. And it's, it's, a, it's the supremely poetic moment of our lives. Poetics is, is the, the science of, of things made and the work to be done. And the mass is where we are recreated. So it's, it's, it's poetry in action. 
and it affects us. And if we lose poetry from our lives, that ability to play with our children and wonder, to, to um, take a walk in the woods, to look at the sky, whatever it is that you find really beautiful and worth your time, if we lose those things, because we think that adults just have to be functional. We just have to earn money and take care of things and the whole world is just a fact. Then we have lost true knowledge of who we are. Um, so however it is that you pray the mass, and I think there's a lot of room for diversity in how masses are offered. Um, it should be done with wonder and joy. Thank you, Father. That, that was tremendous. I was going to compliment just your talk as, uh, as being very moving in terms of your journey towards the beauty, joy, and wonder of the Catholic faith. Uh, I've experienced that myself as a revert, but just your last answer to the question from, uh, from Fred about the Mass being the gateway to heaven and poetry in motion. We could give a whole talk just on that. So thank you very much for coming tonight and sharing your personal story and really uh, enlightening and uh, inspiring all of us. So I hope everybody will come back next month, uh, July 20th. Our Vespers and Speaker continues, our, maybe our Hot Summer Night series, we'll call it. Uh, can't wait to see what July's like if June's 100 degrees. Our speaker on that night is uh, Father Cashin Kuneman, who spoke during, during Lent. He's the prior, the abbot of uh, St. Louis Priory, and he'll be speaking about St. Benedict. So it'll be a, a tremendous talk to hear a Benedictine monk talking about St. Benedict. So please come back. Uh, and also, we have uh, cookies and lemonade in, in the narthex. If you go out and go to the, to the counter, don't just gather over here. The introverts who still want to ask a few more questions to Father uh, Michael are, are welcome to do so. So thank you again for coming tonight, and thank you very much, Father.